And just to review our presenters tonight, you have me. I'm the Science and Operations Officer, which I manage the science program for the office. I do research, so the training for the staff, um, and science education like this. And joining me tonight is Bryce Williams, one of our meteorologists, and Bryce manages our social media program, among other things. Um, if you've attended Skyworm, virtual Skyworm presentation, you probably heard from him too. And he also helps me uh, with most of these webinars. So you have Bryce and I at the controls tonight. So some of the topics we're gonna discuss for marine forecasting, uh, we're gonna start with uh, the definitions for the marine watches, warnings, and advisories. Those are important to know if you're a uh, recreational boater planning to head out on the waters. Talk a little bit about wave terminology, things like significant wave height, fetch, Z, and swells, and rogue waves. Um, then we'll go through some of the forecasting rules of thumb for southern New England. Talk a little bit about hurricanes. We won't get too in-depth. That's going to be for our tropical weather webinar. And we'll finish up with a look at some things about rip currents, uh, freezing spray, which is more of a hazard uh, to commercial interests, really, um, not so much the recreational boaters. Uh, and then also how to find our marine forecasts and observations um, on our website. There's a, a, obviously a wealth of information on the website, so um, we want to help you know you navigate through that. So let's start uh, with our marine watches, warnings, and advisories. So you're probably familiar with these if you're a recreational boater. Um, starting off is the small craft advisory, um, and that is for any winds of about 25 to 33 knots for greater than two hours, um, and or seas of five feet or higher. So if we meet either of those criteria, um, we'll issue a small craft advisory. So this time of year, typically it's for the wind, you know, a gusty, maybe southwest wind during the summertime. Um, as we get into the winter, we tend to issue them more for uh, the seas, which tend to linger after maybe a coastal storm comes through. And then when the wind gets up, a forecast anyway, 34 to 47 knots for greater than two hours, that's when we get into our gale force winds. So we issue gale watches and warnings. Um, typically the watches go up uh, a couple of days in advance, depending on our confidence, and the warnings will be issued usually 12 to 24 hours. We try to give enough advance notice on that. And then stepping it up even further, we go to our storm watches and warnings. That's for winds of 48 to 63 knots for greater than two hours. So that's our uh, bomb cyclones in the wintertime, typically, the big storms. Um, these are not for tropical systems. That's a whole different set of headlines with the tropical storm uh, warnings and watches and hurricane watches and warnings. And then this time of year, particularly, you'll see a lot of these special marine warnings, which are shorter duration um, winds of at least 34 knots. So it's less than two hours. Uh, and or large hail that's usually associated with thunderstorms. So when we have days of thunderstorm development and the storms are moving offshore, um, if we're you know seeing kind of on the radar that there's a good potential for winds of 34 knots or greater, uh, we'll put out the special marine warning and also for large hail. So typically those are more of a, a summertime issuance, but occasionally you'll see them at other times of year as well. So let's start, uh, talk a little bit about wave terminology and when we talk about wave height, we're talking about the height of a wave from the trough to the crest. So uh, what you're looking at the height here, here is roughly uh, the trough of the wave and the crest of the wave. So it's this distance here. Then there's a couple of other terms. One is wavelength. So that's simply the time uh, between, uh, I'm sorry, the distance from ridge or crest to crest or trough to trough. And the period is the time elapsed that uh, it takes this to go by. So we, we start counting when the first wave passes and we end it when the second wave passes. That's the wave period. So smaller periods are associated with wind waves, so it's usually a little more choppy, and our longer period waves um, are typically associated with swells, kind of the smooth appearance, but you can certainly feel it on the water. And then the swells are typically associated with a, a distant storm, or in particular, maybe an offshore hurricane or a tropical storm. So then we have a term called significant wave height, and this is what we use in our forecast, so it's important to kind of know what this, this means. Significant wave height is the average height of the highest third of the waves. So this is the international standard for reporting wave heights. It's used all around the world. So the example listed here, if you were to stand on shore and observe the passage of 100 individual waves, the significant wave height would be the average height of the highest 33. So, uh, you know, some are going to be a little bit higher, and a lot of them are going to be less than that, but it's it's kind of the international standard, and that's what is reported by the buoys, it's what's, and that's what we use in our forecast. So kind of need to be aware um, if we have a wave height forecast of one to three feet that you could, you know, conceivably see waves up to four feet. 
So something to keep in mind. So, you know, why do we use this? Um, studies that have shown that the observed wave heights correspond to about the average of the highest 20 to 40 percent of the waves, which is right in that 33 you know, high, average of the highest third. And this is the height that tends to be um, most readily observed by the human eye. So if you're on your boat and you want to, if you report a wave height, it's pretty much a significant wave height is what you're seeing. And um, this is an example on the right. Uh, if you look at some of the buoys on, on the web, and we'll show you how to get that later, uh, this is a significant wave height. That's how it's reported. So it's the average of the highest third of the waves. So let's get into a little bit more fetch, see, and swell. We'll make this too complicated, but um, you're probably familiar with these terms if you're, if you're maybe a more experienced boater. Um, so the fetch is an area where the wind speed and direction are the same. So this is the area where your waves are generated. So in the example here I'm showing, uh, this is kind of a weather map symbol, but it's a, a west wind at about 40 knots. So it's blowing over this area. Um, this is where you're generating those wind waves, those shorter period choppy waves. Um, they're created by these local winds in this fetch area, and, and as it says there, steep and choppy typically. Then as the waves depart the fetch area, you have what's called your decay distance, where you're losing that stronger wind. Um, you know, the waves are out of that generating area. They become smoother in appearance, and they get a longer period. They turn into swell waves. So you could have maybe a four or five second period. Remember, that's the time between each uh, wave. So four to five seconds is short. And then usually eight seconds or longer for these longer period swells. So that's what we mean by fetch and seas and swells. So in our forecast, you might see uh, the forecast will say, uh, you know, seas one to three feet. Seas are a combined swell and wind wave. It's, it's kind of combined together. Then the forecast for areas like Boston Harbor, Narragansett Bay, you'll see us use the term waves, because obviously in those areas, you don't have a swell component. You're just talking about the wind wave. So here's some examples of fetch areas. Um, we, the ones we see in New England would typically, you know, be here, high pressure moving off the coast, and you've got pretty steady northeast winds. Um, also, in the, maybe in the winter time, we've got, you know, a, a nor'easter coming up the coast. So our fetch area is here. You've got strong easterly winds, and on the backside, also strong northwesterly winds. So it's just defining areas where you have pretty much a consistent direction and a consistent wind speed to generate the waves. So then rogue waves are um, a little bit different. So these are generally twice, figure about twice the significant wave height. Uh, they're short-lived, they're localized, and they're not very easy to predict. And actually they kind of occur pretty much every day, uh, but they really don't become noticeable until the significant wave height increases. So on a typical day, it's you know, a nice calm day on the water with maybe a seas of about one to two feet. You might see a rogue wave that's three feet, but it's hardly noticeable. Um, certainly, as your wave heights get up to about six, eight, or even 10 feet, then you'd notice, you know, your rogue waves would be on the order of 12 or maybe 15 to 20 feet. So they're limited um, by wave breaking. So the rogue wave height, uh, the steepness of the wave and the wind um, kind of determines how high the rogue wave can get. And the higher waves actually occur by delaying that wave breaking. So there's a couple of ways, really the, the way to do that is to relax the wind. So uh, in the winter time, when we have a winter storm moving up the coast, you could have hours and hours of, say, an east or a northeast wind blowing at 30 to 35 knots. That's going to really ramp up the seas. And then as the low approaches, the winds drop off quickly, but you still have all of that wave energy. So this is where you can see the rogue waves. That's typically where they're most favored as that wind relaxes. So certainly it's a hazard, uh, more so in, say, the fall, the winter, the early spring when the wave heights are typically higher than they are this time of year. But something to keep in mind, and I'm sure, you know, if you boat throughout the year, um, you're probably familiar with rogue waves. Um, and certainly if you watch something like Deadliest Catch, you've, you've uh, on TV, you've seen rogue waves in action. So I also want to talk a little bit about sea breezes. This will set up some of the material that, that uh, Bryce is going to talk about. So I think, again, probably familiar with the sea breeze um, circulation. During the day, the land um, heats up faster uh, than the water, so it's warmer over the land, cooler over the water. And what happens is the air over the land rises uh, more quickly than it does over the water. So you need something to replace this air, which happens as the sea breeze. The cooler air rushes in to replace it. 
the warm air rises, it cools and forms this circulation. The cool air eventually sinks over the water and then is pulled back in again. So you get the circulation. It's typically, oh, it could be about 2,000 feet deep, depending on the day. But um, the sea breeze is important uh, as we talk about wave height in a little bit. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar that they're favored on days with light winds, maybe high pressure sitting right on top of the area um, where the air really can't uh, mix very much. Um, so it's it's kind of in a weak pressure gradient. And at night, obviously, the, the opposite is true. The land cools quicker than the water. So you get this circulation going from land out onto the water known as a land breeze. And finally, fog. Um, obviously, this is a major hazard, um, especially in the spring and the summer. And it's, it's really just a, a cloud based near the ground. So the air near the water cools, condenses, and then forms fog. Um, can also form when there's falling rain or snow from the high moisture. And uh, in the winter, we have Arctic sea smoke, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, this is when we have very cold Arctic air passing over, the, you know, the relatively milder water. Maybe it's still in the 40s, but it's that temperature difference that almost forms, it looks like steam under light wind conditions. This time of year, just going back to fog, um, it's typically, we've seen this the past few weeks, we get into a southwest flow with high pressure offshore that's pumping in a lot of humid air into the region. So the fog will develop, especially near the south coast, uh, Cape Cod and the islands during the evening around sunset, you'll see the fog roll in. The clouds and fog linger all night and then gradually burn off uh, kind of from maybe the south coast to the Cape and the islands last. Sometimes it hangs around the islands all day. So uh, that's, that's our typical setup um, for the summertime. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Bryce, who's going to talk about some of our forecasting rules of thumb here in southern New England. Thanks, Joe. Um, so before I get into uh, this portion of it, I wanted to point out, you, it made me think when you said, talking about going back to rogue waves, you said that you've probably seen some if you've watched Deadliest Catch. I was thinking you also probably seen one if, you, if you've seen the remake of The Poseidon Adventure from the early 2000s. They, they claimed that that was a rogue wave that tipped over the cruise ship, but that was a bad depiction of a rogue wave because definitely rogue waves aren't actually like that. So if you want to see a, a Hollywood version of a rogue wave, go watch Poseidon and you'll see how not to actually picture them in real life. But there just an aside I thought of. So right. moving on to forecasting rules of thumb. So our marine forecasts, hopefully you're familiar with them, especially if you are a boater yourself and you're navigating some of our coastal waters. We have all sorts of stuff available and Joe's gonna get into where you can find that on our website later. Um, but one thing that we do forecast is wave heights. And so you can see an example of that um, on, uh, on our website on the right there in feet. And basically when we're forecasting these, we are looking at the wind speed, uh, the fetch, which we just talked about, and um, the, the tide as well. And I'll talk about uh, some specific examples of how the tide can affect those waves and the wave height um, in the next couple of slides. And so, you know, uh, right now, uh, you know, NWS forecasts don't inherently incorporate the tide. Um, we do, when we are making our own edits, um, we try to, to adjust for those. And I'll, and I'll tell you exactly about that in the next couple of slides. Um, you know, when we're forecasting model wave height or wave heights, we're looking at models a lot of times. So computers ideas of what the wave heights are going to do. And there's there's often a lot of, of changes that we have to make because models are, are still struggling with exactly how to bring those those wave heights up and down with as systems move around, you know, our region. Um, so often some examples, often they'll be they'll be too high with those waves when we get into a period where we have south or southwest winds. Um, in the early uh, spring and the winter time often. Um, and then and on the flip side, we'll have instances where if we have east or northeast winds, say with coastal storms, they can often be, you know, a quarter to, you know, around or around a quarter um, low, percent low. And so we have to make these manual edits in the, you know, our, our coastal waters that we forecast for. Some of the most common edits that we make are in the bays and the sounds. They're usually often being making, make, we're usually making those changes to boost the wave heights up rather than down. Um, so let's move on to the next next slide and I'll show some examples. So one um, area that uh, you're probably familiar with would be Boston Harbor. A lot of boats coming in and out of there. And oftentimes we have to kind of set a limit um, to about two to three feet with our wave height forecast in Boston Harbor. 
Um, and you can kind of see there, I highlighted the entrance there, but it's pretty sheltered with, you know, those uh, peninsulas. And so the whole Arf Harbor area has quite a bit of land kind of surrounding it. And that kind of protects from getting those really uh, uh, high wave heights. So really two to three feet is about the maximum that we're um, really gonna see even when we have gale force winds. Um, but the one exception would be when you're approaching um, the entrance of the harbor, especially when we have onshore flow or winds coming in, to, in towards the land, um, the, the waves can get higher. On to the next one. So Cape Cod Bay is another one. And this brings up a point that is gonna um, be relevant in the next several areas of water that we talk about. And that is, you know, that the, I mentioned the tide plays a factor and basically it's gonna pump up those waves when the winds are opposing the tidal direction. So if I'm forecasting, say, two to four feet, um, you know, just, just based on the wind. Then I look at the tide forecast and I see, okay, the tide's gonna be coming out and it's gonna be opposing the, the wind direction um, directly. I'm probably gonna bump that forecast up maybe uh, three to five feet or four to six feet even because when the wind is going the opposite direction of the tide, those waves, or those waves will be increased. Um, so just an example on sea breeze days, you know, you say you have 15 to 20 knot gusts, uh, we can get, we can typically see two to four feet seas occur in Cape Cod Bay. All right, next. Another uh, common area would be Buzzards Bay and the Vineyard Sound. Um, so again, with, and I kind of have a graphical depiction of the tide coming out and the winds coming from the southwest and those opposing forces are going to make it really choppy right there. So, you know, obviously as boaters, you're aware, you're aware of tides in, in those directions and hopefully you're aware of the wind forecast as well. And just keeping that in mind, hopefully our, our wave forecast is, is accurate, but just know that if, those, if this condition is happening, it could be elevated. So there's an example, um, say we get a sea breeze day and we have 15, uh, 15 to 20 knot gusts, uh, we can typically get two, two to four foot seas in this area as well. So Nantucket Sound, quite a bit bigger, bigger area um, and the seas here will rarely get above 10 feet even when we have winter storms um, you know so even in even when like I said those gale force winds kind of like the Boston Harbor um, it's limited a little bit in in just from how sheltered it is with with the, the Nantucket Martha's Vineyard and then the Cape kind of um, having land on on pretty much most sides of it and so you know the, the buoy out in the middle it, you know, buoy four four zero two zero. Um, we generally think you know you can add about one to two feet to 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 estimate what the maximum wave height is going to be based on what that buoy is reading. Okay, so Narragansett Bay. Um, with this one, what you're going to be looking for is if you have north or south winds, you're going to have the 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 highest waves. And that is because of what we talked about earlier is the fetch. So you see, you can imagine the winds moving the way that Joe was just showing the mouse up and down north to south, Those that's along the water. So you're gonna have more area for the, those waves to start to build and build. If it's east to west or west to east, um, you know, the fetch is much smaller and the, and the waves are gonna be smaller. Um, again, similar to Boston Harbor at the entrance um, of the bay, you're gonna have the, the larger waves and again, opposing tide, they're gonna be always larger as well. That's with any, any location. All right, so moving on to another topic. So this uh, is something that you may have, may have become, it really has become more of a familiar term to people in the last you know, several years because it's been used more. It's, it's called explosive cyclogenesis or bomb cyclogenesis you may have heard on the news. Um, but that is a term, meteorological term that's been around for a long, long time. It's just kind of being thrown around more, becoming more common. And what all it, all it means, um, we'll start with cyclogenesis. So basically cyclogenesis is just low pressure intensifying and, and a storm becoming, you know, forming. It's becoming a cyclone. So cyclogenesis and bomb cyclogenesis, all that means is the, 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 rate, as, the rate at which it is uh, strengthening. So to be a bomb cyclone, it has to strengthen 24 millibars in 24 hours. Basically, the, the, the lower the millibars of the, the center of low pressure, the stronger it is. So if the storm uh, drops by 24 millibars in 24 hours, we consider it a bomb cyclone. Um, just an example, and then I'll show a picture 
Uh, I'm not sure if this picture is, is that one specifically, but I, ha I do have a picture next to show that the January 2018 bomb cyclone, you may remember, if you were around at that time, um, it actually dropped 59 millibars in 24 hours. So incredible strengthening uh, in that storm uh, and very impressive. And it looked very impressive on satellite um, as a result. Um, and generally, the Atlantic does have many more uh, bomb cyclones than the Pacific. And you can see that here. Uh, this is a map showing the frequency uh, uh, of explosive cyclogenesis in the North Atlantic. And what do you know, right off kind of our coast is where you see that hot spot, the red, the, the many times, you know, we get these nor'easters coming up the coast and then they get off into the Maritimes and they, and they bomb out, we, we, we say sometimes. And this is the picture I was, or that I was telling you about from 2018. Just look at that nice spiral comma looking um, storm, just really tight spiral and just a very, photogenic storm, you can see the snow of the Carolina coast that it dropped as it, as it made its way up, up the East Coast. So just a, a lot of cool things to see with this satellite image. Now you see that satellite image and you may, it may make you think of these um, very different storms, but also um, something that we deal with in here in Southern New, New England and, our, and on our waters, and that's hurricanes. And so the hurricane season is June uh, through November. Um, and we will get into much more detail on hurricanes uh, in our Tropical 101 webinar and uh, coming up. But uh, just a real quick uh, about about hurricanes and, and what they mean to us here. So you can kind of see the, this map showing the source regions of hurricanes. And for us, obviously, they're coming off um, the, the, the coast of Africa and moving across the Atlantic. Um, they may form around there. They may form in the Caribbean and then they move up the coast. And so, um, you know, this, this is generally the, the way that we get all of our tropical systems coming right up, um, curved like you see there. Now, hurricanes basically just a, it's what's known as a warm core storm and it just feeds off warm air, warm water and moisture. And it's got, an, it's, it's got a very unique structure amongst uh, meteorological phenomena. And you have an eye in the center that's clear you have an eye wall where the strongest uh, uh, the uh, winds are, and you have the, the most violent um, uh, part of the storm there. And then you have these rain bands that expand out from the center. And you can often get lots of flooding, you can get tornadoes with these, and then just the damage from the storm surge, which is the flooding associated with it and the wind itself. Again, we'll talk a lot more about those uh, in a couple weeks. And here's just a satellite view from the top. You see the same things I just pointed out, the eye wall where it's cleared out, um, the, the eye, um, or sorry, the eye where it's cleared out, the eye wall um, where the strongest convection or storms are, and then the spiral rain band bands extending out on all sides. Just a very, uh, very, very cool storms to look at if you're a weather nerd like us. So hurricanes are uh, ranked in, in strength with the Saffir Simp Simpson scale. And this is based on wind speed alone. Now, even though a lot of the damage from hurricanes often comes with flooding and, and stuff, um, th their rank is only concerned with the wind speeds. So you can see category one to five. Um, if it's uh, category three, four, or five, it's considered a major hurricane. And you can see it, it goes anywhere from, you know, category one starts at 74 miles per hour, and then you can get anywhere over 155 is, is considered a category five, a catastrophic hurricane. One interesting thing to note, um, when we're looking at the track of storms coming up the coast towards us, it's important um, because it actually does uh, have an effect whether or not we, or you, you know, wherever you are, are on uh, a certain side of the storm. So you can see the red, the red arrow indicates the direction that the storm is moving, the storm itself. And so it's moving from south to north in this depiction. And, and the winds are spinning it counterclockwise uh, cyclonically around the, the center. So on the right side, you can see the, uh, or the, it would be the east side, you can see the wind, the forward motion of the winds in the storm is being added to the forward motion of the storm itself. So you see, say the winds are, are going 85 knots and the storm itself is moving 50, 50 knots um, to the north. You're gonna add those together to produce 95 it will essentially be 95 knots of wind. 
Whereas on the west side, as you're subtracting the storm motion from the winds, so 80 knots minus 50 knots, so they're only really experiencing 65 knots essentially. So, uh, you know, we like to always say, obviously the safest option is to avoid the storm entirely, but there is, there would be, you know, a, a better, of two, lesser of two evils. Um, if you're gonna be on one side, um, you'd rather be on the on the western side. All right, and with that, I will pass it on back to Joe. Okay, thanks, Bryce. So, um, one of the things we're going to just talk about here uh, are rip currents, and they are actually typically associated um, not just with wind, but a lot of times with offshore uh, tropical storms or hurricanes. So, just a quick review of what a rip current is, and you probably have seen these at the beaches. Um, they're channels of water that flow outward due to the waves. It's kind of the return energy of the waves coming into the coast. Uh, it's a narrow channel of water that can uh, carry swimmers out pretty rapidly. Um, and a lot of drownings will occur when people try to swim against it. Whereas the safest option is to swim perpendicular to the shore to get out of the rip current. Um, or let it take you out to, to sea a little bit and then you're able to escape um, over here once you're out of the rip current. So um, just a quick definition about rip currents. So one way we can track them is to use what are called great circle maps. Um, it's It's been used by navigation for a long time and I'll kind of explain what that is. A great circle um, route is just a straight line drawn on a sphere linking any two points on the map. So it's a good technique for us to track distant swells from offshore storms. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of examples here. So if we're looking at a map, and this is the great circle route for Nantucket. So we're focusing um, our, our great circle on Nantucket. And these are all the great circle routes connecting points on the globe. So out of all these tracks in magenta here, um, when we're looking at all of them, which ones are favorable for uh, big surf in New England? Is it are the you know maybe the ones going this way through the Caribbean or the ones kind of coming right at us? Well, as it turns out, it's the ones that are parallel to those great circle routes. So it would be this storm track here, and especially this one here, because there's a long time where it's following along that great circle route. Whereas these really are focusing their energy away from uh, our area as they move west. So here's an example, this one goes back, this was Hurricane Danielle back in 2010, but we had done a study on it. This is when we first started uh, actually doing rip current forecasting. So you can see the track of Danielle starting out um, in the Atl open Atlantic and gradually you know, moving northwest and then taking a, an offshore turn before getting anywhere near land. But you can see there were about six days worth of uh, swells tracking toward New England. So it's, it's not shown here, but this is really almost parallel to the Great Circle route. So you're taking all this wave swell energy and focusing it toward New England. Now, when the storm makes its right turn, uh, that all that swell energy isn't gonna make the turn also, it's gonna keep on going right toward New England. That's in fact, exactly what happened. So the weather was high and dry and it was a beautiful uh, late August uh, day here in Southern New England, but there were a lot of, um, there was rough surf, uh, strong rip currents and a lot of rescues here on the, uh, the South Coastal beaches from a storm that was pretty far offshore out in the middle of the Atlantic. So that's, that's one thing that we keep an eye on. Um, it's called the sneaky events. So there's these offshore tropical cyclones that don't make landfall. They're, you know, harmlessly out in the middle of the Atlantic, just a concern to shipping. And really they, they get not a lot of attention because there's a low impact to land. They're out in the middle of nowhere, they're recurving. So no one, you know, along the coast is too concerned. Um, but it's something that has snuck up on us a few times over the years. So in our training, um, we always stress that we really need to watch these types of systems for the ones that bring uh, significant swells into the south coastal waters especially as well as dangerous rip currents to the ocean beaches. So uh, one thing we could do and we recommend for you as well um, is to look at the offshore buoys outside of New England you know down and off the southeast coast and I'll show you where to access that in a few minutes and you can look at the uh, the wave height and also the wave direction to see if those swells are actually coming into our waters especially for those of you I know a lot of uh, boaters actually like to go offshore uh, for fishing trips. So that's that's certainly um, a concern if you're going to be heading a little bit away from the coast uh, coastline. So for our rip current forecasting, we have a few guidelines when we issue a moderate or high risk. And again, this probably pertains maybe to the beach forecast more than, than boating. But um, typically when we have seas of four feet or greater across any of our outer 
uh, waters. Those are the ones, you know, away from, from the shore. Um, as well as wind gusts of 25 knots or greater from just about any direction, believe it or not. And especially when we have long period swells of eight to 10 feet or higher, it's the, it's the long period swell that is our main contributor to uh, the high risk days for rip currents. So even the day following the strong winds and seas, um, there's usually another day after kind of what we think is the big event for the rip currents. It usually lasts another day or two beyond that. So quite often we'll have to bump up our risk category to at least show a moderate risk the following day. So for our high surf and rip currents, we do have headlines for that. Typically uh, a high surf advisory is issued whenever we expect seas at the offshore buoys are expected to reach seven feet or higher. Typically, um, that produces high surf at the shore whenever it reaches that seven foot threshold. It also implies a moderate to high risk of rip currents. And these high surf advisories are issued essentially during the beach season, May to September, um, when we have a higher, uh, you know, more people obviously at the beach. Outside of that, if we have uh, seas that, you know, the, the buoys aren't really expected to reach seven feet, but we have um, a high risk present, then we'll issue a, what's called a rip current statement or a beach hazard statement that I'll specifically mention just the high risk of rip currents um, without so much as the high surf. That's a little more unusual. Typically, um, you'll see the high surf advisory issued uh, during the summertime. So to really change gears, um, we're going to talk a little bit about freezing spray. And again, this isn't so much a hazard to the recreational boaters, but maybe we have some uh, commercial fishermen or folks who like to do some fishing during the winter time. Um, this, a lot of the research that was done, and, and actually the reason we have the buoy in Nantucket Sound, buoy 44020, was because of this incident back in 2007, which was the Lady of Grace uh, capsized, capsized in Nantucket Sound 12 miles south of Hyannis um, due to vessel icing. So this is the most dangerous form of icing to vessels. And it's favorable when the air temperature is below the freezing temperature of the seawater. So that's about 28 Fahrenheit, not, not 32. And um, whenever winds are about 18 knots or higher. So the lower the air temperature and the stronger the wind, the more rapid is the accumulation of ice. So the more dangerous it is. Now for us, obviously, this is a kind of a deep winter phenomenon, um, typically January, February. But occasionally it occurs mid to late December, depending on the weather pattern. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, this is this is the most dangerous thing. And the reason is, as ice builds on the vessel, the ability to right itself uh, decreases. So if you add too much weight from the ice onto the vessel, uh, the boat is unable to right itself. Um, and, it, and it's possible that um, it'll roll and the vessel will capsize. So every layer of ice actually creates more surface area for the next layer. And the weight increases exponentially, not gradually. So uh, the more wrap up the build of ice, the more dangerous it is. Uh, and again, I'll go back to my, my show, uh, Deadliest Catch, if you are a fan of that. Almost every season, there's always uh, some case of freezing spray and ice buildup where they're, um, you know, knocking it off with hammers or, or whatnot uh, because it is so dangerous. And, um, you know, especially out in the Bering Sea, uh, many vessels um, have been lost due to icing. I believe there was one this past January. So the danger from icing is just more than added weight. Again, it's the uneven distribution over the hull of the vessel that amplifies the effect. And um, the measures taken to remove the ice can worsen stability if it's only removed from, say, the deck of the vessel and not from um, locations higher up in the superstructure or the rigging. So um, that's why it's a, it's a pretty dangerous situation and things can go downhill very, very quickly. So just a quick look, so obviously, um, this is probably not rocket science to anybody, but areas favored for heavy icing are the North Atlantic and, oh, lo and behold, parts of New England, that's Cape Cod about there, um, you know, Gulf of Maine, um, and close enough to our waters. These are regions of heavy icing um, in the North Atlantic. So to forecast freezing spray, we actually use um, a computer algorithm kind of under the hood in, in our office, but it uses these algorithms, which, um, Simply put, take a look at air temperature over the water and wind speed. Um, they also take into account the uh, the sea surface temperature and um, can forecast light, moderate, or heavy uh, freezing spray. So what you know what does that mean? Well, um, here are the here's the classification down here in inches per hour. So light freezing spray is less than about a third of an inch. Moderate is up to an eight tenths of an inch. When you get to heavy freezing spray, you're talking about eight tenths to 1.6 inches per hour, and extreme is greater than 1.6 uh, 
um, inches per hour. So in the wintertime, you will once in a while, we'll issue uh, headlines for this. A freezing spray watch is issued for the potential for heavy freezing spray. Usually uh, two to three days out, we can, we can pretty much recognize the pattern that's favorable for it. Um, when we get closer in time for heavy freezing spray, we put out a freezing spray warning. And again, that's for this heavy or extreme um, rates of, of ice accretion. And then for a moderate freezing spray, we'll issue the freezing spray advisory. Um, it's usually not a life-threatening condition at the moderate threshold, but enough that we want to get the attention of the, the folks out on the water. And for light freezing spray, it's really minimal, if any, effect on the vessel. So um, that's included in the forecast, but there's no specific headline for that um, during the winter. So there are observations, um, and, if, you know, it's a really cold air mass coming out of the Arctic, and the, the water temperatures are still fairly warm. We'll have some freezing spray. So a couple of ways you can to find these um, observations are on the buoys. Um, this example is the Boston buoy, 44013, outside of Boston Harbor. And you can see this was back in 2008, but there was actually um, 0.24 inch accretion um, per hour. So the, the buoy can measure that, and you can see on the, the chart um, kind of the trend. And also, um, a few times a day, we talk to some of the ferry operators, um, in particular the Steamship Authority, and um, they always report to us the ongoing weather. And this particular day in 2013, um, there was light freezing spray, you can see. Um, we had winds of about 25 knots out of the west-northwest and seas of about three to four feet. So the air mass um, coming over the water was certainly cold enough and the winds and seas high enough to support that. So there are also model forecasts available to help if you want to look online. Um, you can do just a search of uh, maybe vessel icing forecasts. Um, this one in particular is from NOAA, and it's, uh, it's the rate of accretion again, kind of showing the, the light, moderate, heavy. Um, over certain areas of the Atlantic. This was from back in uh, December 2017, but you can see light icing was forecast all up and down the East Coast uh, that particular day. Now, locally, because of that Lady of Grace incident, um, the folks at UMass Dartmouth, um, in particular Dr. Chen here, um, developed a model uh, that they run, and they actually still run it today, and we can see the output at our office to help us. Uh, they've done research on vessel icing. So um, he has a computer model that forecast temperature and wind and um, the, temp the temperature of the water and can actually produce um, a vessel icing forecast. So it does two outputs. One is for a vessel that's stationary and another is for a vessel moving against the wind at 10 knots. And that's the example you're seeing here. So the colors going from kind of green to red kind of show areas of low, moderate, or heavy icing. Um, so this was actually directly, again, right out of that incident from Lady of Grace. Um, so it wasn't just the buoy in Nantucket Sound that was procured because of that, but a lot of research was done on nearshore icing um, to help these the commercial fishermen um, and to help us provide better forecasts to assist them in making decisions whether to go out uh, or not to avoid icing. So we're going to finish up um, just finding some basic marine weather information on the web. You may be familiar with this already, but just in case you're not, um, our website has a, a trove, you know, probably almost too much information on there, and it can certainly be um, tough to navigate at times. But um, if you look under on the main weather page, on our main page, weather.gov slash Boston, under the tab here above the map under forecast, you can go to marine, and that will take you to our marine weather page, which I'm going to show in one second. You can also access it on the lower part of the page. We have a number of icons, and there's a marine icon here um, at the bottom. So you can click on that as well to get there and bookmark the page. So uh, the marine forecasts for our office um, are here, and it shows color-coded areas of what are called zones. And these are areas of typically the similar weather conditions based upon things like uh, wind speed and, and wave height. So our area of responsibility goes from the Merrimack River um, up on the Massachusetts, New Hampshire border, all the way around Cape Cod and the islands to the Rhode Island coast and ends um, pretty much at Watch Hill or near westerly Rhode Island. So our office covers Ma essentially the Massachusetts and Rhode Island coastal waters. Further to the north in, in New Hampshire and Maine, that's covered by the Gray Maine office near Portland. And heading south across Connecticut and Long Island, that's the New York City office that covers that. So um, simply click on the area that you're interested in, say, for example, Nantucket Sound, and it'll come up with a worded forecast right here along with the synopsis that kind of describes the, the prevailing weather conditions. So this comes right out of our office um, here in the Boston area. Now, if you're looking offshore, I know a lot of people like to go for offshore fishing trips. 
Then you're looking at a place called the Ocean Prediction Center, which is down in the Washington, D.C. area, and they handle all of the open waters of the Atlantic. Um, so I know there's a question on Facebook when we posted about this webinar about can you describe some of the areas that I hear in the weather radio. Well, these are all of them right here. So George's Bank is are the waters well east of Cape Cod and the islands. The Great South Channel is located well south of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. So these are typically the areas uh, that we get questions at. These are broadcast on our NOAA weather radio as well. If you're planning a fishing trip, I'm sure you've you've heard of those as well. So these are the offshore waters. And I should point out um, our, our area of responsibility currently goes from about 25 to 40 nautical miles offshore. And then we come to the Ocean Prediction Center. Um, by the end of the year, we're going to be expanding that outward a little bit. So all of the offices along the East Coast will actually expand their forecast out to about 60 nautical miles. Uh, so we'll actually be covering a little bit more of this area than we are now. And then the Ocean Prediction Center will have the areas even farther offshore. So uh, that will be coming to a weather forecast office near you, probably toward the end of the year. So um, we'll be covering a little bit more of Georgia's Bank and the area south of the islands. So also, if you didn't know, we have the, the text-based forecast, but we also have graphical forecasts that are available at uh, digital.weather.gov, and it's also linked on the previous page that I showed you. So you can look at graphical forecasts out in time for things like wind, wind gust, wave height, the weather visibility, um, any of the, the essentially the forecast elements that we produce, um, including things like temperatures as well. Um, you can see them in a graphical format. Use the slider bar to go out in time and use the menus here to, to kind of choose what you want. You can zoom up um, right up on Boston if you want or right up on maybe Newport, um, any of these areas, or even zoom out a little bit if you're planning an offshore trip. So um, the graphics are available. They haven't been advertised very much, but um, we've been producing them for a few years now. Um, and it's another good way to kind of take a look at the forecast. So finally, what about marine observations? Um, maybe you have some sites bookmarked, um, but you can go back on our webpage. Again, the main page at weather.gov slash Boston. Go under the current conditions tab, and you'll find, a you'll find a few options. One is the marine obs on a map, and that will take you to this National Data Buoy Center, along with a map of all of where we have our buoys. And you can click on one of those and get the latest weather conditions from that particular buoy. You can also get a list if you are a fan of uh, list you can go under current conditions to marine obs list. And this is produced hourly um, right in our office. Um, and it lists all of the buoys. It's by their ID, so you need to be probably familiar with them. Um, but it's kind of um, broken down by area. So the Gulf of Maine, kind of east of our area, Narragansett Bay, um, to the south of New England and south of Long Island. So um, the time is in uh, Z time, which is Greenwich Mean Time. So for daylight time, just subtract four hours. And that will tell you. So these are about 8.50 in the morning. Uh, these reports here, but it'll give you all the information broken down from each of the buoys in our area if you kind of like looking at a list. And finally, we also have um, other marine reports under our current conditions tab, and these are the reports that we receive. Uh, we call the ferries two or three times a day, typically around 10 in the morning, 1.30 in the afternoon, and again in the evening around 8.30 or so. Um, we call the Steamship Authority ferries, the ones going to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Also on occasion, the Cuddy Hunk Ferry, as well as the pilot boats out of Boston Harbor and Newport. Uh, so if they're out there and we can get a report from them, uh, we will post those here. So it's another good way to kind of see what's happening out on the waters before you head out. And one last thing I want to talk about, of course, important is boating safety. Um, you can find this on our webpage on the top set of menus. Um, these are more national oriented menus, but under safety, we have a whole variety of, of safety tips for various weather hazards, but also for safe boating. So um, things to learn, you know, before you go out, watches and warnings while you're out, all good things to review, um, you know, prior to uh, the recreational boating season. So hopefully um, you'll be familiar with that. And always, always, always make sure you wear your life jacket. So with that, uh, that is our material on marine weather. And Bryce and I thank you for attending. Again, please um, feel free to send me your feedback. You can use my email address there or go ahead and respond to your webinar confirmation email. Again, I read every email I get. I respond to every email I get. Um, with the holiday weekend, it might take me a few days to get back to you from this one, but I promise I will. Uh, so with that, I want to go through and uh, Bryce and I will answer some of your questions here. We have a little bit of time. Um, so you might see my cursor moving around, but I'm just going through the questions. So 
First question from Joe is for the advisories, are these wins the gusts or sustained? So he meant the small craft advisories in the beginning. Um, those are typically for gusts. Um, usually, you know, it's, it's two or more hours of gust to 25 to 33 knots, and then the gale force gusts will be above that. Um, so most of the time you're going to see these based upon wind gusts and not so much the sustained wind. Occasionally it can. Um, in the wintertime we'll issue a gale warning for a sustained wind of 25 to 35 knots, for example, which the 35 knots crosses that 34 knot um, threshold. So, but most of the time, especially the, in the summer, it's, it's for those gusts. So a question from John, why do secondary low pressure systems form off the coast as a primary low approaches from the west? Bryce, I can give that one to you if you like. Oh, maybe Bryce is muted. I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that then. Um, so during the winter time, secondary low pressure forms um, has to be under the right conditions. Typically, uh, there's a little dip in the jet stream coming across the eastern third of the country, and there's enough energy in that little dip. Um, to form a secondary low off the coast, typically east of the Appalachians, maybe off the Carolinas or the mid-Atlantic coast. Um, it's that upper energy as it comes off the coast that helps transfer the energy from the primary low, maybe over Ohio or the Great Lakes, to that secondary low off the coast. And as that low moves up the coast, it's interacting with the warmer waters of the Gulf Stream and also the difference in air temperature between uh, maybe Arctic air coming in behind the low as well as the warm air ahead of it. So that's why we often will see that um, during the fall and the winter, our typical nor'easters. Hey, Joe, I'm back. Sorry. That's okay. I was, no, not I was on my iPad and it wasn't responding. I was like, I'm oh, here. Not to I'm worry. here. Sorry. Not to worry. Okay. Question from Peter. When do you expect tides to be factored into wave forecast models? Uh, what may the time resolution be? Well, we're actually working on that now, Peter. So we have a new uh, wave model that's being developed. Um, it's being run nationally down in Washington with a lot of our other uh, computer models called the Nearshore Wave Prediction System. And that's actually um, taking the tides into account as well as the wind speed, the wind direction, and then the fetch. So um, we're starting to work with that now on kind of an experimental basis. And I would expect, I don't know, Bryce, you can even help me with this, when we'll be using that full time. I would say probably sometime early 2021. Um, yeah, that, I, I, that's around what I would have said too. In yeah, the and the time year, resolution. In the next year or so. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're kind of, it's, it's being worked on. We're kind of giving feedback and they're tweaking things to make it better. But um, yeah, we're hoping, you know, sometime next year, that'll be kind of our full time wave model, which will help with the tides. Now, the problem is, the, uh, the, the resolution isn't as great that we really need, especially around, say, Narragansett Bay, Boston Harbor. Um, we, we basically forecast on a grid box that's a few miles, uh, you know, in a square. So it's not going to capture local, local effects, but should, uh, it, it should do a better job overall. And as far as the time resolution, that's, that's hourly. We actually do hourly wave height now. So if you go on the graphical page, you can see it in an hourly breakdown, and that will continue. Let's see, Alan has a question. Can you recommend the best page on the NWS website to see the wave forecast and other marine information? Uh, graphical site that Bryce showed in his image or two seems to have been replaced with a new one. Yeah, so that's what I just showed, the um, the more interactive page. Um, yeah. The first one that Bryce showed was kind of the, the first cut at graphics. It's it's just that, you can't zoom in, you can't really do much with it. Um, I would recommend that second one that I showed where you can actually zoom in with your mouse. A little yeah, more. Yeah, is it digi digital? Is yeah. it digital weather .gov? That's the one. I would, so, Alan, I would recommend that. Um, if you have any feedback, if, you, if you're finding it's hard to use, please let me know. Um, we are always in touch with the web development folks and um, would certainly be more than happy to pass that feedback on to them to make it better. So, uh, don't be afraid to, you know, provide us with some criticism too. All right, from WIT. Um, curious if there are any specific wind forecast models that you think are best for certain winds. So um, he's mm -hmm. actually getting to some models. The Wharf 2 kilometer for Southwest winds in Buzzards Bay or Boston, or other models that tend to work better for Northwest or Northeast winds. So Bryce, uh, you're, why don't you handle that one? Yes, I, on, I mean, we can probably uh, tag team this. Um, sure. You know, I, I'm i still uh, getting, a, getting a handle uh, on like it, per, trying to uh, perfect my 
uh, marine wind forecasting. Uh, I'm relatively new to this office as far as uh, marine forecasting. I've always, I've, I'm from Tennessee and I worked in Spokane, Washington, so all landlocked places. So getting, a, it takes a while for, for, for you to really, of, of forecasting with these models to really get a handle on, okay, when did, when did the NAM 3K do really well and what were the situation, what was the, what were the, um, what, what was the synoptic setup on that? Uh, when did, when would the wharf be, be better? Um, honestly, I don't really have an opinion for, for either, either way. So I'm going to have to defer to you, Joe. Do okay. You, yeah. I, you I would just say wit, um, you know, if we're talking this time of year, I would really look at those higher resolution models and you seem to know what they are. Um, certainly like a, a two or three kilometer war for um, the HRRR, which is the high res rapid refresh. Any of those higher resolution models are going to do very well, especially with sea breezes. Um, we really rely on them heavily um, to forecast sea breezes here. The other models, you know, for those of you who may be familiar with things like the GFS or the European, the, the resolution on those models is a lot larger. So what that means is the uh, the grid boxes that it forecasts for are fairly large and even larger than, say, Nantucket. Um, so it's not going to capture these local, you know, sea breezes as well. It's, those are going to do better with your, you know, your fall, winter storms and that sort of thing. So wait, I would say, yes, those higher resolution models are, are definitely the way to go. Um, again, you know, is one the, better than the, the other? It yeah. depends on the situation. And, yeah, in the uh, in the in the zero to twelve hour like you know today forecast time range, the the HRRR or the HER um, a lot of times captures um, sea breezes and things like that really well. The ARW, the NMM, those really um, uh, small uh, mesoscale, really really um, finer resolution. Those just have done really really well in the last you know a lot of improvements in the last five years. Yep, and that's where a lot of the improvement will be in the next five years too. <laughs> Uh, for local weather effects. Okay, question from David regarding rip currents. Are there telltine, telltale signs of riptide danger for the amateur beachgoer? Um, also, what's the length of a typical rip current um, relates to the strategy of letting the current take you for a while? I'm wondering what would happen practically if you decided to do that. Well, uh, are there telltale, telltale signs? Yes, you will see like the pictures I showed. Um, you could even do a search on, on rip currents and you'll see some nice pictures. You almost see the, the bubbling of the water, foaming of the water where they are um, as that water is heading out. Um, the length varies. It depends really on the, the waves coming in, uh, the, the angle of the shoreline, that sort of thing. Typically around New England, um, they're not that long unless you're on some of the ocean exposed beaches. So, you know, we say to let it drag you out, but obviously that can be a scary proposition if you're going yards and yards out. So the best advice is always to swim perpendicular. If you notice you're, you're caught in one and you're heading out to sea, just swim uh, parallel to the shore, in other words, or perpendicular to the rip current, and then you'll come out of it. Uh, but certainly at, at beaches, um, we provide the, the rip current forecast for both Massachusetts and Rhode Island be, uh, beaches for the lifeguards in particular, and they'll put up the warning flags if it's a dangerous day uh, or put up signs talking about rip currents. So that's your best bet. You know, watch for areas where it's foaming, check for flags at the beach or information that they post on signs. Um, and obviously, if you get caught in one and you notice you're getting out, don't don't fight it. Go parallel to the shore and you'll get out of it pretty quickly. Yeah, sometimes it can actually look yeah, sometimes with, with the really strong ones, it can actually look like almost like a, a river within the water, a river of water flowing out. You can actually kind of visualize it and see it visually. The weaker ones, not so much. Um, and But like Joe said, we actually are in contact with the lifeguards um, at several beaches and, and we'll get reports of if they had to do any rescues, most often for rip, rip current um, each day. And so that kind of gives us, keeps us in tune with what's happening on the ground, kind of like storm spotters do with, with severe weather. They're letting us know what's actually happening out there. And so that we can put that into our, our forecast for the next day or so. Right. And again, uh, David, if you want, or anybody, if you do is just do a search of um, rip currents and actually there's some nice YouTube videos that show them. Um, you can actually see them moving. I, I couldn't really throw it in this presentation because it would be bogged down on the webinar, but um, there's some nice YouTube videos you can see also. Okay, question from Mac. What is a marine layer? So that, um, simply, it, it's more prevalent. It's, it's known as the marine layer on the West Coast, I think, more than here on the East Coast. But it's more or less the, the depth of, say, fog or low clouds. So, for example, in the summertime, we get these fog and low clouds coming in the evening. You know, almost we're having it kind of this week with our southwest winds. 
Um, it's kind of just the depth of the, the marine air moving inland. So it can be a few thousand feet thick typically, um, but it's essentially where you're seeing those low clouds and fog and it's cooler temperatures. Um, moves inland during the night. Sometimes it can it can cover all of, of southern New England. Um, sometimes it's just confined to the coast. It really depends on, um, you know, things like where high pressure is, what are our winds doing, uh, things like that. So, Bryce, anything to add on the marine layer? Nope, you pretty much covered it. Got it. Got, says the guy from Tennessee. <laughs> Um, again, know, Mac, right? for more information, uh, you can also do a search marine layer. There's some really good educational things on the web um, from the Weather Service, also from a, a program called Comet, which is an educational uh, program partially funded by the Weather Service. Uh, Fawn has a question. Where can I find detailed water temperatures besides the few buoys that report water temp? Um, let's see. That's a good question, too. We usually typically are looking at the, the buoy temperatures. Also, if you look... Uh, some of the satellite um, websites um, do a search. Uh, one of them that we use, um, you know, you can, satellite does estimates of water temperatures as well. And we actually use that um, in our forecasts. So I think, Bryce, anything else you can think of? Yeah, I was, the only thing besides the uh, buoys, I was going to say sea server temperature um, product on sat, on, from satellite uh, is the, really the go-to that, that I would say. Um, as far as off the top of my head, what website you can access that. Um, I know the College of DuPage has a good satellite website, but I don't know if they have sea surface temperatures on there. I don't think they do. So I would have to do some. Yeah, or, some or fun, you can also, I would say to search, um, you know, satellite sea surface temperature. That, that probably should come up. Yeah. But it's yeah. out there. Um, so you can find it. Uh, Gary just wanted to re-mention the link for the graphical forecast. That's digital.weather.gov. So it's digital.weather.gov is the graphical. Uh, Debbie has a question. What about the marine point detail forecast? I use that every day. Oh, Debbie, we love that. So yeah, actually, if you go onto the map uh, on our webpage, the map of Southern New England, and actually click on the water, or the coastal waters where you're interested in, you actually get a point and click forecast very much like you can get over the land. So example, you know, I'm, I want something maybe in the middle of Nantucket Sound. Click on the map over there and you'll get a specific point forecast um, based upon our uh, the graphics that we issue. So that's another way to go. Instead of the forecast for the whole zone, which is kind of averaged, remember like all of Nantucket Sound, for example, you can get a specific point forecast for a particular part of Nantucket Sound. Maybe it's close to Hyannis, maybe it's off of Edgartown, maybe it's off of Nantucket Harbor. So um, that's good suggestion, Debbie, and glad you're using it. We don't have too many folks uh, looking at that. Amy has a question. What does stationary versus movement have to do with the impact of freezing spray? Uh, it has to do with the actually the amount of ice accretion. So there's actually more accretion if a vessel is moving um, into the wind. So the example I showed was a, for a vessel icing moving, was moving 10 knots, so maybe just under 15 miles per hour, moving into the wind. So think of it um, even with something like rain. Say it's you know, raining, uh, you're, you're running into the wind and then the rain is kind of blowing in your face. You're gonna get a lot uh, more, you know, well, get a lot wetter uh, than you will if you were just kind of standing still, even though you're still getting wet. So um, the research that Dr. Chen at UMass Dartmouth had shown was there is actually more icing that occurs when the vessel is moving um, into the wind as opposed to being stationary. Um, but he provides both forecasts because in some cases uh, the vessels are stationary when they're out on the water. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, Abby has a question. Is forecasting the sea breeze tricky? I sail on Narragansett Bay and Buzzards Bay and on hot days, the afternoon sea breeze frequently exceeds the forecast. For example, sustained winds 25 to 30 knots when the forecast is 10 gusting to 20. And Abby, if I had a dollar for every time I had a comment like that, I could have retired 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. this, has been a, this has been a long standing problem for us. And part of it has to do with uh, you know, as we talked about the models, not having the resolution to do this, but they've gotten better. Um, part of it is the, the resolution of our forecasts. Again, we're essentially forecasting in boxes that are about three or four square miles, um, you know, on each side. So, about, you know, five, five to eight square miles. We can't do these local, local effects. So things get averaged and the wind forecasts can frequently be, be too low. So that's why I stress to the forecasters, and I'm glad Bryce picked up on it, um, when we are creating our forecast, we know that if the tide's coming in the other way or, or if it's a sea breeze day, 
we need to go ahead and bump up those winds and bump up those seas in the afternoon. So I'm hoping everybody is doing it in the office. I've been paying attention and um, certainly Abby, um, if you notice a day where it's, you know, doing what, you know, we're too low, um, you know, my email's there. Let me know what happened uh, because that's something, but this is, uh, this has been obviously a long standing problem for us. And um, we've got a lot of new staff. I've been training them on, you know, to recognize these sea breeze days because I know you'll see on a sea breeze day that the forecast could be five to 10 knots and it's blowing 15 to 20 easily. And the seas, you know, we've got a one foot or less forecast and you're out there in three to four foot chop. So uh, we are aware of it. Um, I'm hoping that that near shore wave prediction system will help us out quite a bit too, but um, a lot of it is also pattern recognition on the part of the forecasters. So that's something I stress to, to training and we will do our best to uh, improve those forecasts. So thank you. Um, let's see. Stephen Hale has a question. And I'm not sure about this one. Uh, how does sail flow wind predictions compare to NWS? I'm not sure actually I what sail flow what that is. is. Yeah, some of them use um, direct kind of these computer models. Others take the weather service data um, and just kind of, you know, prepackage it, which they're free to do. Um, so I'm not sure exactly. You might want to check in with the folks there to see actually what they're, what they're doing. Um, but we do verify our forecasts, um, wind, uh, and for the most part. We can't really verify the waves because we just don't have a lot of observations. But um, they've improved. Uh, I don't know, Bryce, what our latest stats are. but um, the wind, the wind speed and direction are fairly accurate. Um, you know, in the, in the one to two day forecast, we're probably up, I don't know, we've got to be up around 85 to 90% accuracy on those. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm sorry, Stephen, I, I'm not exactly sure what they use. You might want to check with them on that. So, all right, I don't see any more questions and we're just a little past eight o'clock. So again, I want to thank you all. Uh, for attending the webinar. We've really, Bryce and I and then the whole crew really enjoy presenting these for you on different topics. Yes. We look forward to doing more of these the summer and the fall and heck, we'll probably yep. go through the winter too. So, um, you yeah. know, our goal is Please. to be able, I'll just, I'm sorry, Bryce, let me just finish. No, um, okay. Just, we, our goal really is to provide you with some education, you know, interact a little bit more. So you see, you know, we're not just a faceless government agency. We're, you know, just like everyone else out there um, and we enjoy what we do and we hope that shows in these presentations. So Bryce, I'll let you have the last one. I was just gonna say, uh, please, uh, if you if you enjoyed uh, this webinar, if you've been to any other ones, um, please sign up for, you know, our severe and our tropical that we already have. And I'm already working on our severe uh, weather two, two, uh, 202 uh, presentation, which will be happening sometime later, maybe in August. So yeah, just keep signing up, tell your friends and uh, hope to see you guys next time. Yeah, and I just saw a quick thing from Fawn, which other classes are coming up. And uh, I think I have the website right, Bryce. So weather.gov slash Boston slash webinars. Is that correct? Yes. That's okay. Correct. That's our webinar page. We uh, we should keep, I think we're going to keep the link up on our main page up at the top. Yes. Um, but you can always go right to that webinar page. You can also check our social media, Twitter, Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, all of these are recorded. They're going to be in our YouTube page. We're finally resurrecting our YouTube page after years of inactivity. So yeah. uh, we brought Bryce in and he's kind of really freshened up our social media program, which yep. has been a welcome and site. So again, this will be you. on there shortly. Yep. So.